TV KPM. A very warm welcome and happy Tuesday to everyone watching at home right now. My name is Amanda Andrea, your host for today, and this is Didix TV's Success to SPM 2020, the road to success. So I'm really excited about today's topic because it is English literature. But before we get into it, I want to remind you about the SOPs that we most definitely have to remember and follow because it is, after all, the new normal. So do remember, if you can, to always sanitize and wash your hands. Number two, you have to always wear your mask, especially in public places. And last but not least, do always maintain and practice social distancing of at least one meter. Now, we are going to get right into today's topic. Okay, for today's topic, as I've mentioned, it is English literature. So for English literature, there are different facets of it. Today, we discuss on poetry and also novels. So poetry and novels, something that I believe is really interesting. We have a teacher that is well-loved. You can actually check her out on our YouTube channel. She is definitely well-loved by her students. I'm very excited to share a little bit more about her. Now let's have a quick look at her profile. There you have it. We have Juan Renuka here with us today. And as I've mentioned, it is literature in English on poetry and novels. How are you doing today, Juan Renuka? I'm good, Amanda. Okay, that's fantastic. Now, you have been here before, and I'm not too sure if you guys heard me earlier, but Juan Renuka is actually, she has gained quite a following on, um, on YouTube, actually, because she is an amazing teacher with over 34 years of experience as well. Um, another fun fact about her that I want to share is that she also makes some great vanilla cupcakes. Is that Hello. right? Oh, yes. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that's just some fun facts, but then we'll move right into teaching at the moment. Uh, before we begin, let us go over to the table here where we complete some of our SOPs. Okay, because we're maintaining social distancing of one meter, we are actually okay to remove our mask. So you can remove your mask and put them in the container. So I'll do the same as well. Okay, and if you could please sanitize your hands. All right, fantastic. Are you ready? Yes, I yes, am. I, I know you right. were born ready, quite literally. <laughs> now we do, well, I do have a question for you before we delve in. And we're actually going to take a break uh, right after this. So just give us a few minutes. So what happens is we are talking about English literature and we're going into poetry and novels. Can you tell us what are the biggest misconceptions about this elective? All right. The biggest misconception, I would say, is uh, not everyone knows about this elective because many think that it's just part of English. But we have a subject which is known as literature in English. This is the final year uh, where it's known as literature in English. In the year 2020, next year it would be known as English literature. And it is an elective subject where you do learn all the four genres. All right, that is fantastic. And I love that you actually gave clarification on that. Now let's see what the students actually think about the subject. DD TV, KPM. Hi, my name is Krishma Raman. I study in SAP Convent Klang and I'm currently an SPM Batch 2020 candidate. I take literature in English for SPM and at first, while it was a bit hard for me, I was able to grasp the concept of it all and now I proudly say that I can think quick on my feet, I am able to form opinions as well as back those opinions up with facts as we do in literature and I'm also able to analyse things in a deeper perspective which has helped me a lot in competitions such as debate and I'm sure that whatever I've learned in this subject will help me in the future as well. And I 
I just want to say good luck to everyone who's taking the subject. We've got this. Hi, my name is Roshna Ramachandran and I am from SMG Convent Lang. What literature has taught me is that it's given me the skill and the knowledge for analytical thinking. What it's also taught me is that every story always has a deeper meaning in between the lines. All you have to do is just analyze everything you read. And it's also taught me the different uses of the English language and how it has developed through time since the era of Shakespeare. Um, and it's also helped me improve my writing skills a lot. Thank you. D-Day TV, KPM. Thank you, students, for your insights. I really enjoyed listening to them, and I love the enthusiasm. Now, hold that enthusiasm. We are going for a short break, and when we return, we have Ban Renuka, who will get straight into our topics for today. D-Day TV, KPM. Welcome back, everyone. Now, before we begin our lesson, we actually have some students joining us virtually. Let's say hi to them. Ah. Hello. Hi, everyone. How are you? How, how's everyone? Can um, Let's talk to all of you, starting with Noel. If you could please turn on your mic. Okay, it seems that we have some audio issues. That's all right. Uh, can we maybe just try with Durga? And if we can't, then we'll just move on. Okay, that's all right. We have some audio issues, but you can hear us just fine, right? If you can, give me a thumbs up. Yay, okay. So these are students from SMK Asunta, Pataling Jaya, and we're very happy to have you here with us. We're pretty excited. Well, I'm pretty excited as well. We have our beloved teacher here with us as well. And when you are ready, Puan, you may take it away. I'm good, Amanda. All right. Hi, girls. How are you doing? Good? Yes? We'll do you some hand good? gestures for All now. right. Yes. <laughs> okay. So what are we in for today? We are just going to look at... Um, I'll be looking at two genres, which are novel, yes, followed by poetry. Okay, so I would begin with the novels. Now, in the uh, literature in English 2205 paper, there are actually two novels. But uh, we have a choice. We can choose which we want. And I believe that you, those who are from SMK Asunta, I believe that you are doing the clay marble. So my focus today first would be on the clay marble. And then later on, I would go into some of the poems that you would be doing for your SPM as well. Okay? All right. Now, let me start off by giving you a little bit of introduction into Min Fong Ho's novel, The Clay Marble. Yeah? And this is a novel, which uh, the setting of which is in Cambodia during the time of the Cambodian Civil War. 
And uh, at this point of time, Min Fong Ho says something very poignant. And she says, I saw these refugees for what they really were, not the victims of war, but as its victors. They were the people who had, against all odds, survived, determined to start their lives all over again. And that is exactly what our content is going to be on the clay marble. Yeah? And who are we going to look at? Basically, we are going to look at the children who are the victims of war. Okay? Now, we all know that in the clay marble, the protagonist is Dara, and this is her story. Okay, so a quick run through on this is first we see how Dara and her family, how they travel to the Thai border to get rations. Now, Dara's family consists of her, her brother Sarun, and her mother, and they are all victims of war, and as a result of what had happened in their village, they had to move away to come to the border, the Thai border, to a refugee camp known as Nong Chan in order to get the rations, the rice seeds, which are so important for farmers, yeah, to start life anew in their village. So this is where you need to know what exactly the setting of the story is. All right? Now, as we go into Dara and her family coming into Nong Chan, we see how she makes um, connections with another family, which is Jantu, another girl who is around her same age, Jantu and her family. All right? Now, okay. Now, things seem to be going on well at Nong Chan when all of a sudden, you see, it is the period of war. And during war, what happens, Amanda? What normally happens during war, you have got people yeah. dropping shells, yes. right? So people yes. die during war. Exactly. Yeah. That's what war is all about. And we cannot predict what is going to happen the next moment. Today we are happy, but the next moment something happens in which our lives are all changed. And that's exactly what happens to Dara, Jantu and their respective families when the shelling comes closer to them and they have to run away from the refugee camp. So they have to leave Nong Chan. And this is when, as the children, now remember these are children, yeah, victims of war. And as the children flee Nong Chan, yeah, Dara being a young, inquisitive, naive, innocent, hungry girl, she sees this lunch truck where she gets her food. And she says, she tells her mother, can I please go to the lunch truck? And her mother, initially, who is reluctant, allows her to go to the lunch truck. But unfortunately, when she goes to the lunch truck, there is an explosion. So imagine there is so much hope that I would get my food. But when I go to my food truck, what do I get? You know, the explosion happens. And what do you think would happen to Dara now? Injured, heavily injured. Right? Ah, uh, no. Thankfully, Dara is not injured. Oh, thank God. However, Jantu has a baby brother, and that baby is injured. You see? So when the baby is injured, they have to find? Hospitals, A medics. hospital? Yes. yes, exactly. Someone who would come and help them. Yeah. But you see, they are in the process of fleeing. Yeah. And these are children 12 years and 11 years. And how are they going to manage on their own? So Tara goes in search of someone to help the baby and Jantu. And this Red Cross guy comes and he tells them the child, the baby, has to be taken to a hospital. And this is when Dara's journey of self-discovery happens. Yeah? A 12-year-old has now to fend for herself in search of her family. And this is what Jantu tells her. You go in search of the family because only you can bring the family to me and I would be at the hospital. Find your way to the hospital. So Dara's journey begins with this incident. 
Yeah? And it is not an incident which is easy. It is not an easy journey. Imagine yourself as a 12-year-old child, all alone in the midst of war. You do not have anyone to turn to, and you are going all alone in search of your family. Yeah? Otherwise, what would happen is, you see, what war does to us is war causes fragments of families. Yes? And these children are from fragments of families. Dara lost her father. Jantu lost her mother, lost her father. And all that is remaining of Jantu's family are only her grandpa and an older cousin who is also, I would say, a young girl child. She's only around 16, 17 years old. And Jantu's baby brother, who is just a toddler. So can you imagine the emotions that go within these characters, especially when Dara is said, you have to go in search of the family. But Dara takes that challenge, especially when Jantu tells her, you will be able to do it, Dara. And to give you that courage, what she does, what Jantu does is she molds a clay marble for her. And that is why we have the title, The Clay Marble. You see, the molding of the clay marble is such a significant incident in this story. Okay? So she begins her journey. And as she goes through, yeah, what happens is that as she begins her journey into this, she meets with the general, Kung Silo. Now, I'm going through very fast. You know, it's such a beautiful story, and we can go into detail and really see the emotions. And she meets up here with the general, Kung Silo. And can you imagine how much courage it would take a 12-year-old girl, little girl, yeah, to stand up to the general of one of these rebel guerrilla forces. But she stands up to him, yeah? And she demands from him, in exchange to be given food, she demands a job there in the kitchen, yeah? And um, Dara's companion is another orphan whose name is Shane. okay? So, while she's here in the kitchen working for um, General Kung Silo's chef, yeah? One day what happens is that she is taken by the cook to a shed. And at the shed, she sees something very important. She sees the rice seeds that were so important for farmers being threshed, being pounded. And she feels totally upset with this incident. Because you see, when they had come to the border, what they had come for were for the rice seeds. And for, rice, and for farmers, the rice seeds are so important for them to start life anew, you see? So when she sees these precious rice seeds being pounded and threshed to be made into rice for the soldiers, she gets very upset and she leaves the place. She runs out of the place. She still has not found her family. But she was told that most likely her family is here at this Kung Silo's camp, the base camp. Yeah? So she goes there. She runs out. And in the chaos, she thinks she sees somebody who looks like her brother marching. Okay? She sees that. And she goes towards him. But there is a huge crowd of people and she is unable to reach it. And it is at this time when somebody touches her on the shoulder and she realizes it is her mother. So you can see how she is reunited with her mother. So how do you think she would have felt at this time, Amanda? Overwhelmed and Overwhelmed. feeling like it was worth it, maybe. Right, exactly. <laughs> Overwhelmed, happy. Yeah? You see, the disappointment which she had at the shed is now turned into hope, right? Happiness, right? And that day, as she's reunited with her family, she recounts her journey. 
of how she was able to make it all alone to come in search of her family. And she attributes everything to the clay marble. Yeah, you see, it is like us, you know, when we are young, we like to have an object. It could be a teddy bear. It could be a blanket. It could be um, a smelly pillow. Something which we keep with us, which is dear to her, us. And we always attribute it towards things that happen to us. And that's exactly what Dara does. She attributes her reunion with her family to the clay marble. Though there are differing opinions, right? Okay, all right. Now, so she's back with her family, but what is the aim? The aim for Dara is now to go to the hospital, bring Jantu back, and go back to the village, join the next caravan, which would leave in approximately two weeks to go back home. Okay, so that is her aim. And she manages to go back to the hospital. Okay, all right? She goes to the hospital, she gets to meet Jantu, she brings baby and Jantu with her, but unfortunately, Camellia, can you tell me what happens on the journey back? Camellia, can you tell me what happens? Yes. Yes. All right. Can you tell the me? The journey back? Yes. What, what happens as mm -hmm. Jantu, Dara, Nia and baby are going back to the camp? What happens? A shot. Um, the shelling happens. Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So there is a shot in the dark, right? Noel, would you like to tell me what exactly <coughs> happens at that point of time? Um, so as Dara and Dante, they all were coming back. Um, unfortunately, they took a wrong turn. Yes. So a shot was shot. And I think... Sarun was one of them, one of the soldiers, soldiers. at guard. Yes, mm. right, exactly, yes. And uh, what happened to Jantu at that point? Very good, Noel. What do you think happened to Jantu? Uh, she got shot. Yes, she got shot. She was injured, okay? And that's also a turning point. You see, if you look at novels, there would be a number of turning points, yeah? And every turning point is what you should all concentrate on because you want to know what's going to happen next. Imagine when they come there, come to Nongchan and they think, and they, uh, think that things are fine, but the shelling happens. That's a turning point, yeah. okay? And as they are moving, you know, fleeing Nongchan, what happens, she sees the lunch truck, she goes there, but the turning point is the explosion at the lunch trap. So if you look at the story, there are a number of High turning levels. points. Yeah. Ups and downs, exactly. Definitely. Right, Amanda. Yeah. A lot of ups and downs. A lot of hope, a lot of disappointment together with the hope. Okay, all right. And this is where, um, just to continue with what Noel had said, Jantu is shot and Jantu is on her deathbed, yeah? And I've actually come towards the end of this story in terms of the synopsis, as Jantu is on her deathbed, read up those texts, those chapters, chapters 16, chapters 15, see the conversation between Jantu and Dara, and they are so, oh, I would say overwhelming, yeah? And they give you a lot of emotions because Dara learns a lot of things from Jantu. And one of the most important statements is this. War is like a soccer game. And the people who are in this game, they are tossed around just like a soccer ball. And that is what war is all about about. So focus your attention on this. Read up that conversation between them. And as you read up the conversation, you are also given a deep insight into what the whole story is about. Okay? And at the end, we see how she is able to go home, 
by standing up to her brother. Okay? Right. Now, some of the things that we need to look up is, number one, the setting. As I said earlier, this is in war-torn Cambodia. Yeah? This is the period of time when the civilian war was going on in Cambodia. So the things that you need to look at are the villages. Yeah? The village from where Dara and her family flee, from where they go to Nong Chan. That's your second setting. Nong Chan is a refugee camp at the Thai border. This is where the family goes to get their rations, to get their rice seeds, the fishing nets, to get the hose. They're all farmers, fishermen. Yeah? So they go to get all the supplies in order to start life anew. From Nong Chan, the next setting is the Kau I, uh, no, before Kau Idang is the uh, base camp. Kung Silo's base camp where Dara is able to reunite with her family. And then we have got Kau I Dang. Yeah? Kau I Dang is a refugee camp. And at this refugee camp, we see how the refugees are all waiting to be transported to other countries. And within this camp, the hospital is there. So this is the camp that she goes to in order to bring Jantu and Dara. Uh, sorry, uh, Dara goes to bring Jantu and baby back to the family. All right. Now, from the setting, we look at the characters. Yeah. We look at Dara, 12 years old. When she first comes there, she is naive. She is innocent. She is that typical baby. You know, a typical baby who needs comfort from her mother. She sits on her mother's lap. She's just yeah? a little girl. All right, she's yeah. just a little girl. Mm. But overnight, she changes. Yep. Yeah? And what does she change into? Can uh, Durga, can you tell me some of the changes that happened to Dara? She became stronger. She became bolder yes. to face uh, problems and challenges in life. Right, exactly. Excellent, Durga. Good job, yeah? Durga. What happens is overnight she becomes a young adult. Yeah? And she has to face the challenges which are waiting right in front of her. Okay. From Dara, we move on into... Now, remember, Dara is your protagonist, your main character. Yeah. From Dara, we move on into the other characters. We have got Jantu, who is Dara's close friend, Someone who teaches her a lot of values, who teaches her, uh, you know, the importance of being courageous, being brave, who teaches her to stand on her own two feet, who motivates her, who tell, who, you know, subconsciously, in a way, it tells her to realize her own potential. Okay? Then we have got Sarun. Now, when you read the story, you will get upset with Sarun. Yes or no? All right, I can see nods. Okay, Amaris, can you tell me, why do you get upset with Sarun? Um, because Sarun's character developed into someone who is selfish. He only thinks about himself. At the beginning, he wanted to return to their village and start life over as a farmer. But as the story goes on, we see how he's brainwashed to become a soldier and he stops putting others before himself. Right. Excellent. You have given a very detailed account on Sarun's character. But don't get upset with him, you know, <laughs> because sometimes circumstances push us into such a situation. Okay? All right? Yeah. We have got other characters like Nia who is quiet, but we see at the end that she too can stand up to Sarun, okay? And then I think, you know, most girls, they like Shane, yeah, the orphan, and you feel a sense of pity for him. And um, many of my girls ask me this, teacher, why doesn't Shane go back with the family at the end of the story? But he has his reasons. He's been an orphan all the while, and he is used to um, going unnoticed in the crowd of refugees, okay? Then we have got mother, grandpa Kem, baby Naboot, 
Doik, yeah, also a very important character who loses his limbs. And the, all these characters reveal to us what war is all about. Okay? War is nothing beautiful. Then we have got to know a little bit about the symbols. Okay. What does the clay marble symbolize? Yeah. Uh, Isha, uh, Isabel, can I know something about the clay marble? The clay marble is what Jantu makes for Dara in order for her to have courage to right. do things herself instead of having someone do it for her or have someone be with her in order to do what she wants to do. Yes, excellent, Isabel. That's exactly what the clay marble does. Without her realizing it, the clay marble is actually a catalyst. A Good. catalyst which allows her to see that she is able to do things on her own. The courage, yeah, the ability to find her family single-handedly. Yes, so the clay marble was just a catalyst. Then we also need to know a little bit about other symbols, like for example, the clay dolls. This is what the children used to play with. And the clay uh, dolls are actually, uh, what I would say, something which the children hope their lives would be like. Remember I used the phrase earlier, fragments of families, yeah? And what these children desire are real families. And by playing with the clay dolls, we see how these children want both the families, Dara's family and uh, Jantu's family, to be reunited or to be united in order for them to become a real family. Okay? Then we have rice seeds. And rice seeds are so important because that is the livelihood of the farmers. And when we look at the rice seeds, we look to see how the rice seeds, you know, when they first come into Nongchan, how much importance it plays for them. The first time Sarun sees the rice seeds, it's like he is transported into another world because they are of high quality yield. Yeah? But when Dara sees the rice seeds being pounded, being thrashed, yeah? That's when her dreams are crushed. It's as if the rice seeds I have come for are now being destroyed. Okay? Right? Okay. And from this, please do focus on the themes. All your 12 mark questions deal with the themes. So know your themes very well. Relationships. Yeah? Friendship between Jantu and Dara. Okay? The love relationship between Nia and Sarun. The mother-daughter relationship between Dara and her mother. So know the relationships. Now, literature is always like this. Know your texts very well. And use evidence from the text to support whatever opinions you give. Okay? Then we have got the themes on determination and perseverance. And a little girl is so determined to find her family and it pushes her on her journey of self-discovery. Now, the next theme is hope and disappointment. And I always say this is like two sides of a coin. Every one of us go through this. Now I have the hope. The next minute, something would happen and would turn into disappointment. And just like that, that disappointment that I have can go back into being hope, okay? All right, so know your incidents where you can find hope turning into disappointment, disappointment turning into hope, and so on and so forth. Then we have got the theme on separation and reunion, okay? Courage. The focus of this story is in the courage that a little girl has to go on a journey all alone to seek her family, okay? All right? The role of women, or I would say the role of children. Yeah? Um, young children who you can see overnight, war changes them into adults. Okay? And most importantly, war. This is what war does to us. War causes immense suffering. 
nobody is spared in a war, whether it is the soldiers, whether it is the victims, you know, no one is spared. But the focus of this story is in how the children are not at all spared. They themselves become victims of war. Okay, uh, we see how Doig has lost his limbs. We see how Shane has been made into an orphan. We see how Dara and Jantu have lost, like Dara has lost her father in the middle of the night, and he was found uh, dead the next morning. Yeah, the saddest part is we see how Jantu is shot, and later she dies uh, with. Dara next to her. I don't know, but every time when you come to this section, it becomes a very emotional part to see a young girl who has actually got a long life ahead of her having to end her life in such a way. Yeah? Okay? All right. Now, uh, when we're doing literature, it would always do you some good to know some quotes. Okay? And some of the quotes that we have is, I'm just going to go through fast. I might just pick one or two. Okay, I love this quote. Chapter 16, page 141. Look at this quote where Jantu tells Dara, it's, referring to war, it's like an elaborate soccer game, except that they don't use soccer balls. They use us, yeah? The victims of war, they are treated as soccer balls who are tossed and kicked around to the, um, you know, uh, to the fancy of the generals, maybe, yeah? But that is war. What can we do when a war is being uh, uh, fitted out, right? Okay? Then another important um, quote is in Chapter 7, when... Dara wanted to take all the clay marbles as they were fleeing, yeah? And Jantu tells her this, things that can break are not worth taking. It is only what you can bring inside of you that really matters, meaning the memories that you have of people. That is what you take with you. You cannot go and take things which can break with you carry with you the memories yeah okay and uh, i love this quote in chapter 13 when uh, nia tells dara the reason why the clay marble worked is because you believed in it mm -hmm. and magic has a way of working for those who believe in it that's okay, fantastic. so that's what's very important about the clay marble. Believe in it. It's just like you are going to sit for your exam. Believe <laughs> you can and you would do it. Definitely, you are definitely right about that. You guys have to believe in it. And students, I think you did a good job of answering. You must be quite proud as well. So oh, I'm yes. sure um, we are actually going to go on for a quick break before we move on to poetry. Okay, so for those of you watching at home, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. d TV, KPM. d TV, KPM. Welcome back, students. I do hope that you had some, well, I wouldn't say fun, actually. It was a little bit of a sad story, but I do help, uh, hope you found that really helpful. I thought it was very insightful. We're going to move on into poetry right now. So over to you, Puan Manuka. All right. Thank you, Amanda. All right. So from the novel, let's look at a few uh, poems. I won't be doing all the poems. Um, when you get your exam paper, you will see that there are three sections on poems go straight into the nature poems because I understand that's what you have studied. So go straight into the nature poems and there are six poems that you have studied. Please make sure you know your poems by heart, okay? Because you do need to take um, lines, phrases uh, from the poem in order to help you answer, okay? All right, now let's look at Address to a Child during a boisterous winter evening by Dorothy Wordsworth. You know, Amanda, have you heard about William Wordsworth? 
daffodils? Yes, I actually have. Yes. Yes. This is his sister. Sister. Ah. Right. Okay. So Dorothy Wordsworth. Words poem is such a beautiful poem, and this is a poem in which she talks to her nephew, a little boy named Edward, in which she tells him, do not be afraid of the wind, because the wind can carry on different facets. The wind can be your friend, and at the same time, it can be your foe. Yeah? It can be helpful, but at the same time, it can also wreak havoc and create destruction in its wake. Okay, so when you look at this poem, every stanza look to see how Dorothy Wordsworth moves from the portrayal of the wind as gentle and mysterious in stanza one, how she moves on into the wind as a rascal, a playful, uh, win someone who seems to be playing with you, you know, uh, when the wind goes into a nook and rings an alarm and shrills as loud as a buzzard cock. Yeah, so these are things, and you also see how the wind can be playful, whereby he he's able to bring the leaves which are strewn on the ground, he blows those leaves into a heap for beggars and thieves. So you see, the wind can be your friend. It's not necessary that the wind is bad, okay? All right, then we move into stanza three. And in stanza three, we see how the wind is portrayed as a powerful being, yeah? In the morning, when the um, poet, together with her nephew, goes out into the orchard, what does the poet see? Yes, Kadira, what do you think she sees in the morning with her nephew when she goes out into the orchard? Does she see an apple tree like that? Or does she see everything destroyed? Kadira? She sees that everything is destroyed. Yes, excellent, Kadira. All Good right, job. so she sees that the wind has wreaked havoc. Yeah, everything has been destroyed and this shows us the power of the wind. Never underestimate nature's power, right? Okay, in stanza four, we see how the wind is like a beast trying to get in as he rattles on the rooftops. Yeah, and he creates so much havoc. But the best part is when the poet tells her nephew, do not be afraid because within the shelter of the home, the wind cannot reach us. And that tells us uh, the safety of a home, the security which a home provides, no one can break it. Yeah, okay. And uh, finally, in stanza five, we see how the wind is trying its best to come into the home, rattling the doors, rattling the windows. But the whole place, the house is uh, secure, okay? And unwanted strangers cannot come into the house, okay? All right, now the focus when you are doing your revision, remember the themes. Remember the theme of respecting nature. Remember the literary devices. Do not be afraid with the terms. Personification, don't be afraid. There's personification, there is imagery, you know. Do not be afraid of these themes. These, uh, sorry, these literary devices. These are just to tell you that, you know, when um, poets are writing, they do use a certain technical or poetic devices to make their poems interesting. Okay, so for instance, uh, one of the uh, poetic devices used is imagery, whereby she says, you know, the snow, uh, hold on, the snow, where she talks about the snow, and she says, it's as round as a pillow and whiter than milk. And it is as if you can imagine how snow looks like. Remember, the title of this poem is Addressed to a Child During a Boisterous Winter, the key word is winter, a winter evening. 
So during winter, there is snow. So the image that you can see is that of the snow, which is round as a pillow, softer than, um, softer than silk. Okay, all right. Now, we have got images of how the orchard would look like when it is destroyed by the wind. We also have got uh, images of a home, images of a warm, cozy home where the candle is shining bright. Yeah? And nothing can touch the security and safety of a home. All right? Okay. Then we have got how she contrasts the outside and the inside of the home. Our outside, it's destruction. But inside, it's safety and security. She contrasts stanza one with stanza three. Stanza one, the wind is playful. Stanza three, the wind is destructive. So you can look at this. Now, most importantly, when you see these terms like poetic devices, now, do not get afraid. If you can't remember what is personification, what is imagery, what is contrast, it does not matter. As long as you can take out examples and say, you know, um, the way the poet has made this poem interesting is by showing us images of how the snow looks like, you know, to show us that the wind is actually playful, you would score. You would do well in that. Okay? All right. Now, the next poem that I have is Moses. Okay? And um, let me see. Durga, what is your favorite part about Moses? Uh, my favorite part about Moses is how the moose trying to like it. It feels uh, it doesn't fit inside the society because of its um, how does it look, its features. Right. It and feels like it does not fit inside the society. Yes, very good, Durga. Okay, so when we look at the poem Moses, what are we looking at? The Moses is actually a reflection of us humans. And as humans, we all undergo this situation whereby sometimes we come to a place which seems familiar, but at the same time, it is unfamiliar because of the changes to our environment. It could be a social environment, or it could be a cultural environment, or it could even be a physical environment. And these changes yeah, have got an effect on us. And that is exactly how the moose feels when he comes into this environment, which seems familiar, but at the same time unfamiliar, and therefore he panics. And when he panics, we see all his actions. He crashes into a lake, yeah? And he comes out of the lake, dragging half the lake after him. And then he stops, and he looks at the mountains, and he asks himself, where is my world? You see, that statement is so important. Where is my world? Yeah, my lost world. And that's exactly how we humans also feel when we think we have been uprooted from familiar surroundings. Yeah, we feel a sense of helplessness, being a lost. sense, right, of being lost, of hopelessness and all these feelings are what we see in the poor moose okay so when we look at moses of course we look at the themes the feeling of being lost helpless hopeless yeah the feeling of alienation the feeling of being displaced from one's natural surroundings so look at all the lines to support these statements. Now, you see, the poem is not a long poem. It's not as long as a dress. In fact, it is shorter. It's, you know, like uh, a dress has got something like around five stanzas or four lines each, yeah? But Moses does not have that at all. The lines are shorter, yeah? The words are also to the point. And don't you think it's very sad when the moose sees another moose and he thinks he is seeing a reflection of himself. And he cries. Yeah? 
And that's so sad, isn't it? Because sometimes when we are displaced and we have lost our bearings, and this is what we think, oh my God, the, whatever I have felt before, it is not there anymore. Yeah, life has taken a turn for the worse, and the poor moose stands there crying together with the other moose, and they are nothing but two dobes of the deep woods. Okay, all right. Then, know a little bit on your literary devices. I had touched on the symbolism of mooses. Yeah, what is the moose? It is actually a reflection of us humans who have been displaced from our surroundings. Know a little bit about how the writer uses hyperbole. Yeah, hyperbole is exaggeration. So the writer, the poet uses these devices to bring the poem alive. So what is important for you to know is for you to know the poem by heart, for you to support whatever analysis, whatever opinions, whatever views you give, support all these with the evidence. You, it is not that you must know the poetic device, it is more important how that device is used to convey the message. I love the analysis of that. That was actually right, really good. Right, exactly. Um, do you have yes. any crucial final key points that you can share with our students? Okay, my final key point. Ah, I like that. Okay? <laughs> now, what's important is when you see your questions, you have done everything. Yeah? the questions, you would have done it with your teachers. Yeah? You would have, only thing is, you know, examination conditions are always this. We panic just like the moose. <laughs> but taking a deep breath and tell yourselves, I'm confident and I will be able to answer well because I know my text well. Okay? And with that, all the best students who are sitting for your exams on Thursday, go with a cool head enjoy answering the questions keep on writing as much as you can give your views and support it with textual evidence and good luck girls all the best for your exams thank you so thank much you. Manusha. and thank you to the students who have joined us i loved um, your interaction and i know that quite a few of you actually did your homework so you were actually quite prepared for the questions okay i will say quite a few of you all right I, you know who you guys are but you did fantastic so great job now that is all we have for today ladies and gentlemen and all students parents teachers watching we will be going on to our next segment right after this i think about five or ten minutes we're going to also still be on english literature but this time we move on to short stories and drama but until then my name is amanda andrea your host for this session. Until we meet again, see you soon. Dide TV, KPM. Hi, my name is Agnes Christina and I am the mother of Karishma Raman. Last year has been a very challenging year with schools closed most of the year due to COVID. All students had to make the best with online learning via schools and tuition centres. My daughter has been using passing questions to guide her towards her SDM. To me, she has done her best to prepare. I wish my daughter, as well as all SDM students, Batch 2020, succeed. Hi, I am speaking on behalf of Loshana Ramachandran, who is my younger sister. What I hope for her is to have the courage to aim for the best and not just settle for what is acceptable. I think that literature has helped her understand the discipline of working independently and how to critically analyze her way of thinking and learning. I hope she applies this to her methods of learning later in life, how to read between the lines and that there are many different ways of approaching a topic and that this applies to the learning process and basically any other subject.